So welcome to parallelization of code in Python for beginners. Um, today I'm going to talk about how parallelization helps computation on data run faster. Um, there are many use cases for this. Uh, I've listed some below. Uh, the first, you can see large data set pre-processing or processing. So whenever you have you know, a number of transformations, filters, operations, et cetera, being applied to a large data set, you know, and just going record by record, if you will, batch by batch. Um, another example, uh, extensive function calls. So training perhaps multiple machine learning models at once uh, is an example of that. So hyperparameter tuning use case for data scientists. Um, we also have potentially batch scoring of online machine learning models or any kind of function where it accepts just one record at a time, but you want to do more than that faster. Um, you can use parallelization to speed that up as well. But I'll note, this is not a substitute for vectorizing your code. And there's another talk out there on vectorizing code. Uh, what I mean here is, in general, try to use built-in functions first from whatever Python package you're using, because these are often built in to actually leverage existing parallelization or fast matrix algebra packages. Um, an example here is NumPy. And of course, Pandas is built on top of NumPy. So if there's like a built-in min or max or what have you, try that first. And then you can actually wrap some of these parallelization functions from joblib around that. Um, so it's, it complements that, but it doesn't substitute it. So when can we use parallelization and how do we recognize those use cases? You can really use these techniques when we don't have dependencies across data or calculations. So certainly low hanging fruit, if you have two tasks you wanna execute on data, but they don't depend on each other, then perhaps there's no reason why you can't run them simultaneously if you have enough computing cores on power to do so. So below I have three example quote unquote graphs of computation uh, to illustrate potential dependencies in different jobs you might want to be running. Hey Cheryl, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, do you have, are you sharing slides? Uh, I don't think. Yes, <laughs> can you not see them? No, I, I don't think so. I think if you uh, look at the bottom there, All right. the present button. Yeah, I want to make sure everyone can see those. Yeah, I'll just, can you see it now? Like when I'm flipping between? No, no. No. <clears throat> oh, I see, I see. I didn't hit the present desktop. All right, yeah, share screen. Let's see what that does. I know this will hopefully, oh. Okay. I am sorry about that. <laughs> no, that looks good. Now you can see it. Very yeah. good. Okay. So, yeah. All right, going back to the, here's the graphs of computation. Uh, let me know if you can't see it, uh, but uh, on the very left, so we have one example um, of just a pipeline. And by a pipeline, I mean you're, you're running through different stages in computation sequentially. Uh, and the thing about this is that there might be dependencies between different stages of computation, different steps. So uh, here I have kind of um, a modeling pre-processing example. And, you know, say I first want to apply a filter to select a certain date range of my data. And then after doing that, and only after doing that, do I want to apply some kind of string matching via a regex filter? Well, in that case, I can't actually parallelize those two steps because I only want to do the second step after the first step. However, what I could do is, you know, in order to speed up this computation, uh, computation tends to run faster when you're processing smaller batches of data. So what I could do is I could actually break up my data set into multiple chunks and process each chunk through the pipeline separately. So a second use case might be this middle example of model scoring. So say I have some kind of an online model that's built to just handle one record at a time. In this case, what I could do is, you know, it's the same function being applied to every single record in the data set. Um, so what I could do is I could break the data set into, you know, X many chunks and then just run my scoring operation, you know, on different chunks in parallel. So again, recognizing similarities across the computation and independencies amongst the data or what have you. But on the very rightmost side, I have um, an anti-example of model training. Um, in this case, you know, I, I really like to 
um, say I'm building some expensive, you know, long running uh, machine learning model. I'd really like to be able to parallelize the learning of that model on data. But unfortunately, I often cannot do this. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, the first is that when I'm training a model, I actually need to make use of the entire training data set at any given point in time to learn the weights. Uh, so that kind of breaks the dependency, the independency between, you know, being able to chunk my data and then run it through the pipeline or, or calculations, you know, par in parallel. Um, similarly, you know, there's actually dependencies between each sequential step of the of the um, modeling algorithm process itself. So I can only do, you know, step one after step two, because the way the, the weights are learned for this model, they actually have to happen in sequence. So, you know, that makes this an anti-example. Now, what kind of techniques do we have for parallelization where there's pretty much, there's two, there's two techniques, multi-threading and multi-processing. Uh, I'd like to explain, you know, what, what these mean. So I think these can be kind of confusing to newcomers. Um, so these are really doing two different things. They're not really interchangeable. Uh, multi-processing indicates a paradigm for using multiple processors or CPU cores to execute computations simultaneously. Multi-threading, in contrast, is dealing with a single CPU core, but executing computation on that single core faster by making use of multiple CPU threads. Uh, you can consider CPU threads as fundamental units of computation that are working together to execute a process. A process being like a Jupyter notebook, you know, cell, you're executing a cell, you're running a Python function, uh, you're running Python, just, you know, period. Um, uh, so on the leftmost uh, schematic, we can see, you know, the use case for no parallel processing, a single processor running a single thread. Um, here you can see, this is what the operating system sees. So it's it's uh, running computation via this thread in this process. The process is the big box, um, and it needs to allocate some uh, objects to to execute that, op that computation. You don't really need to understand what these are, the code data files, register, and stack, but just be aware that they are taking up space in memory, and the operating system is using them to run the computation. On the middlemost example, we have multi-threading. Uh, and in this case, again, it's just one big box is the overall process, but it's been split into multiple threads, which are sharing some of those objects in memory. And it's speeding up the computation because you have two threads to execute the same thing. On the rightmost use case, you have multiprocessing. And in this scenario, it looks like it's the very leftmost case of the single processor thread being stuck together. And that actually is what's happening. Um, so in this case, you have kind of farmed out uh, two processes to execute this Python function or whatever it is, two different CPU cores. On the middle case, that's just running on one CPU core. On the rightmost case, you can actually farm out these two processes to different CPU cores. Um, uh, but as you do that, uh, you're actually duplicating the data in memory that this the operating system needs to execute the computation. Uh, whereas in the multi-threading case, you'd been sharing some of that. So multiprocessing is kind of safer because it does wall off these shared data structures that the operating system needs. Uh, it's easier to write, you know, multiprocessing in that kind of sense. Um, but it's also kind of potentially slower because there is that increased overhead. You're duplicating, you know, those shared, th those objects that the operating system needs multiple times per process, per core. Um, so uh, multi-threading, you know, it, it does reduce some of that overhead. Um, but again, it's kind of trickier to deal with. It's not really appropriate for every, uh, for, for a naive application, because you have to be careful how the threads access that shared data. And it really is kind of perhaps most effectively deployed by application developers. You have fine-tuned control over that. So let's, uh, we need to actually perhaps delve a bit into the pieces of the computer that we need to understand to effectively use uh, multiprocessing and multithreading. And, and the two pieces we need to understand more about are the cores and this, or CPUs and memory. So the thing you, you should kind of 
takeaway is that for each CPU core, we can allocate a process and multiprocessing to speed up computation. Uh, so, you know, uh, desktop computers today, this laptop that I'm working off here uh, has, you know, four or more cores. So maybe that's a 4x speed up. Well, not exactly because there's overhead, but that's the general idea. So what are these processes that we've been talking again about? Again, to kind of reiterate, uh, processes are computing tasks like, you know, running a Python function or a Jupyter notebook cell. Uh, whereas threads, in contrast, are fundamental computing units of a process, uh, and processes themselves can be multi-threaded uh, to make computation run faster or more efficiently. Um, so another example is you have a browser process, and a given thread in that process might be to control the back or the forward button. Another thread might be to control the scroll bar or to make some backend data request to a server or something. So we can have parallel computing by running processes in parallel on separate CPU cores. That's the use case we're gonna focus on. As well, uh, you need to consider memory and the specific memory requirements of your job. Um, so consider again, that if you're doing many tasks in parallel, uh, that, that computation is, you know, depending on what it's doing, it's creating objects in memory, it's destroying objects. It needs some kind of memory for scratch space. Um, and as well as that, you might be passing in large and, and uh, large arguments to the inputs of your function. Uh, that will take up space in memory. And remember that, you know, in the multiprocessing scenario on the right here, uh, for each core that you parallelize your computation, you're duplicating those objects across those cores. Um, so in an extreme case, you know, you might run out of memory and you might actually crash your computer. Um, one note, on Linux, you can run the top command to actually see your running threads and processes. And to kind of clarify what we mean about multiprocessing here, um, consider that you have a single core computer. Uh, well, if you run top, you'll actually see multiple processes running, but that does not mean that they're multiprocessed. Uh, you only have one core on your CPU, so it's not running in parallel. What's actually happening is that the operating system is switching between all those processes very quickly. The only way to have parallel computing and multiprocessing is to actually have multiple cores. Uh, I would recommend actually when you run job lib jobs or parallel computing that you do kind of run to top or some other command to make sure that yes, the processes are launching as expected and they haven't died or anything. So we're gonna focus again on using multiprocessing um, because it's what we're using job lib, it's, and the job lib devs also kind of, you know, note this, that it's, they recommend using multiprocessing. It, it tends to be easier for wrapping around black box code. Um, and it, you know, it does suit a fair amount of use cases given today's computers having multiple cores um, themselves. You know, the caveat again is that if you're um, duplicating uh, large data in memory because you need some input data to be shared, uh, not only shared, but deployed to multiple cores, then, you know, that's kind of a, a downside. Uh, there's also more overhead, uh, but uh, multi-threading, again, is much trickier. Um, in either of these use cases, you kind of have to be aware of, are you sharing data sets or objects among multiple cores? Uh, certainly, you don't want to write to uh, the same segment in memory for a shared object. That's kind of a gotcha. Um, so just kind of be aware of when you're writing to, like, say, a shared input argument or something. Um, uh, and again, again, um, so basically the, the, the takeaway is that multiprocessing is, is kind of easier to use, especially when um, you're wrapping this job lib around uh, code where it itself is based on some Python library and you're not sure exactly the inner workings of that. That can make multithreading harder as well. So now we're going to go into an example in Joblib. Uh, the code is available publicly at this Git repo. Um, what we're going to do here is kind of illustrate the design choices you have when you're designing a Joblib job. How do you actually break up a single big computational task into many smaller ones so that you get the benefits of parallelization? So hopefully you can see my Browser, yes, you can. Okay. 
Um, so we're going to be working with uh, kind of like a machine learning workflow. I have two examples here. I'm probably just going to get through one, but we'll see. Uh, the first example is kind of data preprocessing, and the second is um, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, going to be working with uh, Amazon Find Food Reviews data from Kaggle. It's about 500,000 records. This is what it looks like. Uh, we're going to actually be caring about the text field, which is you know a string of text, uh, as well as the score field, which is the user's review of this product, this fine food product, on a scale of one to five. Here's what the text looks like in a panda series. Um, there's the distribution of the scores. Uh, five is best, um, and it, the, the scores are kind of weighted towards the high reviews of five. Now, whenever you want to work with text data, it does tend to be more computationally expensive, and you want to get a sense of how long that text is. Um, so here I'm just taking the character length of each review and looking at the distribution. Um, they're fairly short, actually, um, but there is some data skew towards you know much longer uh, review text. That tends to happen in nature. <laughs> so identifying opportunities for parallelization. Again, you know, with this pre-processing, you're typically going to be going record by record, so that you know parallelization should immediately kind of leap to mind in that use case. Um, say here, I want to do some uh, apply some regex filter, regular expression uh, manipulation of each record of text in my data set. Uh, say what I want to do is I want to remove any sentences that are related to package delivery. Uh, and I only want to focus on the review related to the product itself. So here I have an example text, um, an example, example review. Liked it, the package arrived fast, the cookies were flaky and tender. And what I want to do is to remove this middle sentence because it's about package delivery. So what I do is I write a regex to identify any offending sentences. Um, and then I write a function that takes in a, a string of review text, with multiple sentences, that regex, and goes ahead and removes the offending sentence and returns the cleaned, sent, the cleaned review text. Now without joblib, uh, let's see how this performs. Um, so uh, here I am just you know, applying that function across my uh, text, my appended series of text. Um, and I'm going to, you know, I, I know this is kind of an expensive function to do, so I'm not going to try to shove the whole data set through it at once. I want to see how it scales. Um, so I, you know, for 1,000 records, it takes only one second. For 100,000, it takes two minutes. So it looks like it's scaling linearly uh, by the number of records here, which is good. But once they get past 500,000 records, it looks like it's slowing down and taking longer than linearly with the number of records. Um, 500.6 thousand records takes 13 minutes. And so two things. One is that 13 minutes is kind of too long for me already. Uh, but the other is that the fact that it's slowing down um, after around 500,000 records indicates to me that the more data beyond this data size, I definitely want to, con going to consider parallelization because it's just, going to, it's just going to take longer and longer to execute that code. So now we get to joblib and their embarrassingly simple for loop solution. So again, you know, the use case here is I'm just looping over each record in my data set. So why not split this amongst different cores in my computer? And there are two kind of design parameters you need to consider here. Uh, the first is the number of workers that you want to send computation to, or the number of jobs, uh, just the same thing, um, uh, as well as the chunk size of each job. So you know how big of uh, a data input are you going to give each worker? Are you going to give each worker a single record of that pandas uh, series? Are you going to give them you know a chunk of records of that pandas series? Um, so number of jobs or workers is kind of easy. It's going to be the number of cores in your uh, computer. Generally, want to max that out. Um, chunk size is kind of trickier. And this is where you want to consider the memory requirements of uh, your job. So again, uh, if I was duplicating, um, if I had an input argument that was very big, and I was duplicating that in memory you know, four times on my computer, it's not going to be a problem. 
Um, here I just have my only input argument besides the text itself is the regex uh, string. That's tiny, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, but that it is something that you want to consider um, if you are you know, thinking about the, the size of the job you're giving each worker. Um, the other thing is that the more jobs uh, you spawn, um, I could potentially spawn like over 500,000 um, you know, processes here. Is that going to be a problem? It's a lot of overhead. Um, it depends on your computer and you know, you know, potentially the job itself. So you're going to want to experiment. So one thing that I do need to do um, to do this experimentation is I'm going to need to create a functional wrapper around my original function because I potentially want to give each core of my computer an iterable of text if I want you know, to give them a chunk of, say, 100,000 records at once. Um, so my original function only took in a single string, and then I applied that across my pandas series. But here I just want to wrap around it a function um, that's going to take it an iterable of strings, and then I'm just going to apply across that iterable my original function. So it's pretty simple. Here you can see the actual job load call itself. Um, so I have these kind of two input uh, variables. The number of jobs has kind of fixed to the number of cores of my computer. I guess one note here. So I have an Intel CPU, which does have hyper threading. So I have four physical cores, but because each physical core is hyper threaded uh, to have two virtual cores, logical cores, if you will, I supposedly have eight cores, but for job load purposes, I'm only going to care about the physical cores. If I specify eight here, it's not actually going to speed up my computation. Um, as well, uh, we have the other parameter, the number of chunks, which is going to imply the chunk size. So for me, because my data set is like 500,000 records, if I divide that by four, uh, this four chunks is going to imply like 125,000 records per core at a time. So from joblib library, I'm going to import these two functions, parallel and delayed. The inputs to parallel are going to be inputs related to the actual parallelization. N jobs is going to be the number of cores or workers um, for, so it's going to be four here. Um, I'm going to prefer processes, uh, which is again also uh, preferred by the job lib developers, is that you go with multi-processing first in most use cases. Um, you can actually specify the backend, which will also determine multi-threading versus multi-processing. Um, but they prefer that, job devs prefer that you would instead hint that you, whether you prefer processes or threads, so that's what I'm going to do here. Um, and then I'm going to set maximum verbosity. Uh, batch size, I just set to auto. Um, so the output of parallel is itself going to be a function. And the input to this function is going to be the output of the delayed function. Delayed is itself going to wrap around the function that feeds a, ch a chunk of data or a single record or what have you to each of the workers, so a given core. Um, here I'm going to feed it my uh, uh, function that takes in the iterable of, of records. Uh, that itself has its own arguments, which is you know the chunk of data itself as well as the regex. Um, here I'm just splitting up my kind of series, my entire 100,000 records into four, uh, say 125,000 each. Now, with four, four workers um, and one chunk each, so four chunks, it's going to take me only six minutes, so it's over 50% speed up. Um, and you can experiment as well. Uh, with this particular job, it didn't really matter what I picked. Um, it's always was kind of around six minutes. Um, here you can see if I do specify my max number of logical cores, it's not actually increasing the, or speeding up the runtime. Um, but of course, if I decrease the number of workers that I send computation to, it does slow it down. Um, and below, Joblib has printed out some stuff for me uh, with my maximum verbosity of 10. Um, and you can see here that it really is executing computation in parallel. Uh, so there are, again, four tasks because I have four chunks of data. Um, and 
the first task finishes in five and a half minutes, but the remaining three only finish 0.1 minute later. So it really is executing in parallel. So the result of this uh, function call is going to be a list of lists. Uh, the first layer of lists is going to be the number of chunks. The length, the length is going to be the number of chunks, and each chunk is going to have uh, 140,000 records uh, in it. So then I have to aggregate them up by just decomposing that list of lists, and that takes, you know, it's really quick. So I don't have to worry about that. And then I have my final result. Now I could again have actually fed a single record into Joblib at a time and have had my four workers cycle through, you know, all 500,000 tasks. Uh, in this case, there's actually, it's not that bad for me to do that. I still get a six minute runtime, but you can see it really is launching 500,000, like, you know, tasks at once. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just going to speed through, just really touch on the high level of this hyperparameter tuning example. Here I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, class, I'm building a classifier. I'm going to build a GBM to classify scores into high versus low. Um, and instead of parallelizing over data here, I'm going to parallelize over multiple models at once. So I have a situation where I want to build multiple versions of the GBM uh, and I have different hyperparameter combinations like arguments to the GBM that I want to test at once. So I end up with 54 combinations. Each model takes about a minute to run. And if I, you know, if I go through that one by one, it's going to take me like an hour. Um, but I can parallelize it with Joblib, uh, same technique. Um, and I get runtime in only half an hour, uh, which is great. Um, but I might be worried here. Like, so I'm, I have this huge input argument, my training data set, right? Am I going to be, it's going to be a problem for me to be duplicating that four times in memory across my cores. Actually, no, because this happens to be a pandas data frame, which is based on NumPy, and Joblib has this thing built into it where it's going to pass large NumPy arrays by reference. So it's not actually duplicating it in memory. Um, this is great if I'm just passing in, like, you know, read only or things that are just going to be read. Uh, but of course, if you're writing to a large NumPy array, be aware that if you end up writing to it, that's that could corrupt your data. But here it's definitely an advantage. Um, and allows me to speed up my model training. So that's my example. Um, uh, I could suppose I could have, I just have a few more kind of tips and tricks. Uh, oops, I did do that right. So some gotchas, again, avoid writing to overlapping segments of data and memory. Um, uh, there, there's that shared NumPy data caveat and read the documentation here um, on the Joblib page. The other is multi-processing and multi-threading. Uh, generally it works and especially if you're using the low-key backend, but there can be some edge cases. Um, uh, as well, I would note that uh, multi-processing calls to external servers may not be a good idea because the servers themselves have their own mechanisms for handling multiple requests. So your calls may go into a queue anyways, and it could give you any effects of multiple calls. Um, and then just some tips and tricks. Uh, start out small and see how runtime scales. Um, the one frustrating thing can be if your job crashes. It's likely because you've run out of memory in some form. Um, so there's kind of a, a balance of things. You want to tune the number of jobs or, or, and or the job uh, and the job size, essentially. Um, try increasing the number of tasks, potentially, um, within reason. It, if you're doing that, you're feeding smaller chunks of data to a single worker at a time. But then again, you, if you have large input arguments, you're duplicating those in memory. So depending on what it is that's causing the crash, you know, as long as you're aware of how things work, try to, you know, try different combinations. Um, to adjust that overhead and or duplication of things in memory. Um, if that fails, you know, you can always process things in batch with multiple calls to Joblib. Um, you also are going to want to be wary of data skew. Uh, a single more complex record can cause bottlenecks, uh, maybe even crashes, so potentially filter out such records and handle them separately. And that's it for me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, and I will make this repo public, and I'll probably publish the slides there as well. Thank you.